a look at today's passage together, which is an unusual one. It is, God is faithful to the blessed and broken. Chapter 21 is an interesting one. We've been through Abraham's story um, for a while now. We're coming near the end. Um, so we'll, we'll look at three things in this passage. We'll look at, one, we're going to look at promised joy, the kind of hope, the kind of blessing, the kind of joy that people in the family of believers have. Secondly, we're going to look at sorrowful exile. We're going to see what it's like to be cast out or not part of the family of God. What is life like when we do not have God by our side? And lastly, we're going to look at faithful God. How God is faithful to both those who are within the family of God and those who are also, unsurprisingly, outside the family of God. God loves us all. So open your Bibles to chapter 21. Um, you've, you've read it. The story goes kind of like this. Um, they have Isaac that they've been waiting for a long time and his firstborn Ishmael is about 17 and he sees what happens and he's probably feeling very threatened, very insecure and he mocks our last of his, his younger brother that everyone's celebrating and there's a big divide in the family. It might seem very cruel but I'm sure as we read this passage it's not alien to us. If, if, not, if we're blessed not to have such things in our own families or extended families then certainly from the countless TV drama, so uh, trash TV that's available out there. You can see how human emotions can get really heightened and all sorts of nonsense can happen. Um, and they go into the desert, and then the desert, God speaks to Hagar, uh, which is unusual, someone who isn't actually saved, but God speaks to her directly, gives her a promise of hope in the new future. So let's go into this together and see how we can learn a little bit about God's faithfulness, what it looks like to be in God's family, and what it looks like to not be in God's family. A few questions for you. First one is, how are non-believers saved? How do people who do not know God, how are they saved? And what responsibilities do we play? Uh, if you are saved. Secondly, why and why does God bless and allow non-believers to prosper? Why does he allow even the wicked to prosper? Thirdly, if I want to be used mightily by God, if I want to have a certain hope, a future, I want to fulfill my destiny, whatever that is, what kind of person should I be? What kind of person is God looking for? To promise joy, sorrowful exile, faithful God. So we do a little bit of a recap. Promise joy. God brings about his promises through his grace. And when it comes, it's the most joyful occasion. You're familiar with the human story by now. Mankind has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not content with living under God's rule, representing us, Adam defied God's commands and was banished from God's holy presence. Plunging headfirst into this world as we know it, marked by sin and strife, with death and disaster. But if you open your Bibles and you flip back a few pages to Genesis chapter 3, 3 verse 15, right after this world was cursed to sin, God promised that one day that would come a seed, is the word that is used, but translates first offspring. But you can see how those words can mean the same thing. A seed would come who would defeat sin on our behalf, but pay a, a grievous price in the process. Now, if you were God, not that you ever would be, but if you were God, who would be your hero to champion this cause? What kind of characteristics do you think God would look for in someone he would want to use like this? And so to progress his his restoration for humanity, he chooses someone like Abraham, the most unlikely of candidates to bring about this promise. He was old, he was flawed, he was scheming, and he was without an heir. He was 75 years old when God called him, and yet God promised that through his seed, through his offspring, the peoples of the world would be blessed, that restoration would come to humanity. It would take some kind of miracle for this barren elderly man and his wife to sire a child, much less become the father of many nations. Where were you 10 years ago? What year is it year? this year? 2021. Where were you 10 years ago? 2011. Oof. Some of you <laughs> wasn't even on earth at this point. Um, 
that's it. That, that boy who just dabbed there definitely wasn't around then, I think. Um, what has happened since in 10 years? It's a long time, isn't it? 10 years, a whole decade. You know, and in that 10 years, you could have been waiting for something, you could have been hoping for a deliverance, a blessing, and an outcome. How long is too long for God's plans? Abraham and Sarah were 75 years old. 75 years old. They were ready to retire, probably. But they were called by God to an adventure. Wow, if God can call a 75-year-old to an adventure, how much more can he call us? For 10 years of, since the promise, he was, they've been waiting and hoping for something that hadn't come. It was impossible to begin with, and now it inconceivably seemed even more impossible so what do we do as humans when we can't get what we want? Like Adam and Eve in the garden, Abraham and Sarah takes matters into their own hands. They judge what is right and wrong for themselves. And as a result, Abraham fathered Ishmael through Sarah's maidservant, Hagar. But this was not God's plan. This was not what he intended. And this resulted in unnecessary pain, strife, and hardship. It's like if any of you have ever driven a car and you're stuck on the traffic jam on the M25 and you're, say, on the middle lane. And you look at the left lane, you go, oh, that's moving a bit quicker. I'll, I'll change, I'll, I'll just bust my way into the left lane. And two minutes later, the right lane is moving faster. And you say, oh, you know what? I made a mistake. I'll go to the right lane. <laughs> and then after you drive for another, you stay in the traffic jam for an hour, you realize, wait a minute. That, uh, that big lorry, that big truck with the Coca-Cola sign in it, that was miles behind and now it's miles ahead, you know? Sometimes taking shortcuts or trying to scheme really doesn't pay off, and it really doesn't pay off for Abraham and Sarah. So I guess there's, even in the introduction, there's a lot of application for us. Set your heart on God and don't be tempted to be wise in your own eyes. What does that look like? You know, it could be you're looking for an advancement in the workplace. You're sick of this job, but you, you know it's where you need to be. And, you know, you could act christ likely. You could be a part different from your colleagues that scheme and gossip and do all sorts of nonsense to progress. Or, or you could join them. It worked for Peter. Why not, why, why not work for me? Why wouldn't it work for me? And so you could try to scheme. But I guess the message here is that the call is not to be wise in your own eyes, but to, to trust in God. It could be you're looking for a partner for life and you're thinking, oh, all my friends are doing it. You know, I just want to get a taste a little bit. I just want a bit of experience. I'll just, I'll just do it. The rest of my friends are doing it. And when my partner comes, my partner comes, I'll just shortcut the process a little bit, you know? And I guess the idea here is that it doesn't pay off. And um, on a separate note, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, it says, But God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chooses what is weak in the world to shame the strong, so that no flesh might boast in the presence of God. So that no person can boast before the presence of God. You see, God's plan for the restoration, the salvation of mankind cannot come from human schemes, but only by the grace of God. It wasn't a mistake that God chose Abraham. For God had purposefully chosen what was impossible in the eyes of the world to make possible. The weak to shame the strong so that we might acknowledge that we are saved by his grace alone and not by human efforts. It's like a horse trainer trying to win, I don't know what the, what's the most prestigious horse race? Ascot, the royal ascot? Shout to them. None of us are into horses or that posh. It's like a horse ra trainer trying to win Ascot, for example. I'm not even sure if that's how you enunciate it. But instead of choosing the best horse to work with, he chooses the weakest horse, the horse nobody wants to work with, the one that's a little bit shabby, looks a little bit crooked on the hoof. You know, but God purposefully chooses such people to, to bring about his glory because he, he's... In a way, God is proud of himself, and he should be. He knows who he is, and he wants us to realize that we can only rely on him. So as a Christian, if you have inadequacies, you feel like you're a place in life, and you feel like an imposter. I don't deserve to be where I'm supposed to be. I don't know if I, I, I should be having the responsibilities I should do. Oh, I see an opportunity, but I don't know if I should take it. Well, have faith in God for the responsibilities he has given you. 
It could be sharing the gospel. It could be encouraging others. It could be being a great parent. It could be being a good son. It could be being a good colleague. In each of those places, God has called you to serve Him. And don't feel like you're inadequate. God has chosen and, and in the past, and He chooses people like you to, no matter how lowly you might think of yourselves, no matter how lowly people might try to make you think of yourselves, it doesn't matter because God chooses the weak to shame the strong, just as He chose Abraham, and most unlikely of candidates to bring His promise for mankind. Now, verse 1, it says, it says in verse 1, The Lord visited Sarah as He had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. And what did God promise? He had promised that she would give birth to a son, to Isaac. An impossibility, a miracle. Sarah was 90 years old and Abraham was 100. By way of a quiz or trivia, how old do you think the oldest uh, woman who ever gave birth was? I'll give you a clue, as a, a fun fact. She was in Britain in the 1990s. How old? How old was the oldest lady who ever gave birth? 62, good guess. 65, oh, getting cold. A bit lower. 60, oh, it's getting very hot. 58, it's a bit cold now. 59, that's yeah, the answer. 59, and apparently it was a surprise. She, um, yeah, she had gone through menopause and somehow one slipped out and then she, she gave birth. But Sarah was 90. Impossible, no chance. So, so imagine the, the illustration earlier of a horse trainer who's choosing a horse that's lame um, or, or that that's, nobody wants to win the race. Now imagine that horse is not only the one that nobody wants, it's also old, so past its prime. It's also a bit lame, it's got a broken leg, two broken legs. And that's, that's precisely the, the person God chooses to, to reveal his glory here with Sarah. And there, therein lies another application for us. You know, on one hand, God is reminding us that He can use anyone. He will use our weaknesses to display His strengths. But on the other hand, I think there is also the idea of humility here. Jesus reminds us, whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. What kind of person is God looking to bring forth His wonders, His glory? God chooses the most unlikeliest of candidates that the world will not even recognize to bring about His promises and His great plans. And so too with you. If you think God can use you because you're someone special, because you are, you've got a certain uh, gift that people remind you of, that you're particularly proud of, then let God's election here be a reminder that God gives grace to the humble but is opposed to the proud. On, on, on the contrary, that if you, you think you're too meek or too weak to be used by God, then that's exactly the kind of person that God wants to challenge to use to display His glory. So now verse 2. And Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the time which God had spoken to him. It was at the appointed time, 25 full years after the calling, When, when God gives you a calling, when it's certain, trust in God's timing. That doesn't mean you are inactive or not proactive. But if He's given you a direction, trust in it. Keep walking in it. And again, it could be, as I used those examples earlier, advancement in the workplace. It could be finding a spouse. It could be living a certain way that God has called you to. But persevere in it and trust in His timing if He's given you a specific calling. Now, a lot is made and debated about what it looks like to be saved by grace and not by works. Some fearful that Christians would grow complacent and an excuse to sin. Others, rightly concerned that we might revert to legalism or some misunderstanding of our relationship with God, having effectively put our efforts above God. And here, a very practical example is shown of what it looks like to live by grace and not by works. In verse 3, Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And then, verse 4, Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. So yes, Abraham and Sarah had been called. Yes, the miracle had come from God. 
but it was up to them to respond in obedience, to call Isaac the name that God had given him, and to also to circumcise this young boy eight years old, eight months old, eight days old, sorry. It's, it's like adoptive children. If, if someone is adopted into the family, they are part of the family. There's no questions. There's no question about who they were or what they, they did. They're now part of the family. But the child has a responsibility to play. The child has to accept his new role as a child. He's got to accept his role as, uh, as a child in the family. And if he chooses to rebel against that, or he's adopted into the family but doesn't stay at home, doesn't honor the parents, doesn't do anything that resembles a family, then that that election probably that, that adoption probably wasn't valid to begin with if those things didn't follow. So as Christians, it's it's important to internalize your identity as a Christian. You know, you live in pursuit of God and certain pursuit of holiness because that's who you are as a Christian. You've been adopted into this family, you've been grafted into this family. And so because you're in this family, this is how you act. You you want to, to, to be charitable, you want to love God, you want to love your neighbor, not because you have to. Because that, but because that's who you are as part of the family. And it doesn't end there. What kind, what, what kind of relationship does this look like being in the family of God? It's a, it's a most joyful one. If you look at me at the first eight verses in chapter 21, the first eight verses, how many times is laughter mentioned? I'll give you a quick 30 seconds to count that. How many times in the first eight verses is laughter mentioned in this chapter? Five, twenty-one. Kind of twenty-one in eight verses. So I've counted. And here's the answer. I've counted six times, because, and some of you are already nodding at me because you know why. Because Isaac, the name means he laughs, or figuratively, God laughs. And it's such a joyful occasion, and the author really wants to remind us that. Every Every opportunity is finding this laughter, there's joy. God's promises come. This is what it looks like to be in a family of God. There's joy, there's happiness. People are laughing, people are celebrating. That's a great feast. You know, this, this is what it looks like to be not only to receive God's promises that's given us, but also to be a part of the family. You know, what was Jesus' first miracle? Water into wine. And was it because Jesus was a drunkard? Was it because Jesus just loved the red wine? No, but because of what it represented, that in Christ there is new life. There is just like there is a feast when Isaac is born, so also there is a feast, a uh, figurative feast when somebody enters into the family of God, but more importantly, one day, one day when, when God will make all things new again, that's going to be a great feast for all of us, um, a great joyful occasion. And so in the family of God, there is this internalized joy, a strength to live through each day, knowing that God is with us, and there is hope, and there is joy in the present and for tomorrow. So in this little section, we've looked at what it looks like to be in the family of God, to, to involve God's grace, his election, as we live patiently and hopefully uh, with faith and hope. And the next point, sorrowful exile. And yet, this occasion was only joyous to those who were part of it. Have you ever not been invited to a party that you really wanted to go to? And you imagine yourself standing outside the window in the rain while everybody is having fun inside. And that's your favorite cake being eaten. You go, oh, I had that for my birthday. <laughs> You know, I, I don't have to go too far into an example, but you can imagine it. It's awful. It's an awful feeling to not be invited to the party. Now, at this great party, the fulfillment of God's promises with Isaac, there was one who laughed. I wish I understood Hebrew, because I'm sure the word play here would be immense. But there was one who laughed, but not as one partaking in the celebration, but as one who mocks from the other side. Who is it? It's a joyful occasion for the family, but there was one who scorned at the occasion like an outsider, like an enemy. Verse 8, But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, laughing, or figuratively mocking. 
Ishmael is associated with the world. Someone whose inheritance comes not from God, but from the world. God's promised heir had arrived, the one through which all the people of the earth would be blessed. More than himself, Isaac represented the fulfillment of God's promise, the power of God's grace, God's plan for our restoration. So when Ishmael mocked Isaac, he was inadvertently mocking God. He was denying God of his rightful place. My, uh, my friend who works in one of those corporate firms, she, um, she's great. She just speaks her mind, basically. And the director comes up with this great idea one day in the meeting. This is how we're going to revolutionize the company. This is a great idea. And uh, she just shoots down his idea. She's only like low-level stuff, but she just points out all the holes in his plan, finds, tells him how terrible the idea is, while everybody else is squirming in, in their seats. And why is everybody squirming in their seats? You know, she's not doing a wrong thing, so to speak, because she's, you know, be strategizing and thinking what's wrong with the plan. But the problem is by, by, by questioning the plan, by showing irreverence for the boss's plan, she's inadvertently challenging the boss himself. We're all too familiar with that relationship dynamic, whether it's in our family or our friends or even ourselves sometimes. To say nothing of that situation, for us as Christians in the family of God, mocking has no place. To sit in the seat of mockers, there is no place in the kingdom of God. So be careful when you moan or are ungrateful on the hardship. If you gossip about your colleagues or your boss, or you're, you're mocking other churches and other people, you, you, you'll know what God's plan is for some other people. So instead of being a mocker, much better it is to show grace and to show love. As we will see that God shows to someone like Ishmael. Does God mock Ishmael for mocking, mocking Abraham's, uh, for Isaac? That would be awfully juvenile of God. Imagine we read the Bible. Ishmael laughed and then God laughed at Ishmael. Like that would be so juvenile, wouldn't it? So Sarah's motherly and protective instinct kicks in when she sees this happening. And it's harsh. She says, get him out of this family. He will have no part of this inheritance. Now, the last time Sarah came to Abraham with a plan, he blindly followed it without consulting God and it led to disaster. In fact, it led to the very split in this family. And he distressed Abraham because he loved Ishmael. He was his firstborn son. But this time, having grown in his faith, Abraham listens before acting. And to our very surprise, what does God say? He tells Abraham to carry out Sarah's harsh instructions, but yet reassures Abraham that he will be faithful to Ishmael and bless him as well. You know, it's important not to presume God's intentions. You know, if you were writing a moral story here, when Abraham listened to God, you would imagine God would rebuke Sarah or, or, or something like that. And, make it into a fairy tale ending, right? But strangely enough, God actually allows this, dare I say, this evil, so to speak, this harshness, this cruelty to happen. Don't presume God's intentions. Listen before you act. Spend time with God daily so you're in step with the Spirit. Don't presume you know sometimes what God wants you to do. It's important to keep in step with Him, to, to listen to Him. There are times where God will call you to make difficult decisions in your life that will bring this comfort or pain or hardship to yourself or to others. But sometimes, and if we're careful, sometimes that's part of God's plan. How might one listen to God? It's a subject for much discussion, but, but you can do it through various ways, through praying, through reading His Word, to following the direction of His Spirit that is in you, to discussing with other spiritual brothers and sisters. Now, as such, since Sarah's commands had become God's commands, Abraham follows it to the letter. What does he do? He sends them away in the cover of darkness without any inheritance, the bare minimum a banishment, a separation from his family. He had loved Ishmael, but yet here we, he trusted in God to provide for them as he had promised. It's easy to judge Abraham and say he's done something horrible here, but what if, what, for a rich man like him, what would have been the easier thing to do? What would be the easier thing to scheme? You know, it was dark. He could have sent them away with some camels, some donkeys, some food. If at least, if we've seen him in the most uncharitable light, if at least he could have done it so that his conscience wouldn't be burdened. But yet, 
Abraham does the more difficult decision and he obeys God to the latter. Because why is it so harsh? Why is such a harsh decision done to Ishmael and Hagar? But after all, it's, it seems like they don't quite deserve this proportional response, a propor not proportional response. And I think perhaps it's as harsh as it is because of God's plan for salvation. He had promised that the seed would come through Abraham and it cannot be divided. The way to God is through Abraham's lineage, through God's plan for salvation and no other. There is only one way to God. There is no partial salvations. Some people philosophize and they say, if God is the top of the mountain, then many religions are just different ways to reach the top of the mountain. But I think here in, the, in this plan, God is reminding us that there is only one way to the top. And any other path that anyone tells you will lead to dead ends, to disasters, to nowhere but the top, anywhere but the top. So only faith in God and which we'll see soon, comes through Jesus Christ. So, looking at Hagar and Ishmael, this illustrates to us as well, figuratively represents to us life outside of God. Ultimately, that those who are not in His grace, who are not in His family, will be cast out with nothing, wandering in the wilderness, aimless, hopeless, with nothing to call their own. True joy and restoration is found in the family, in the kingdom of God alone. Thirdly, faithful God. The story doesn't end there. Because the God, as we know, is faithful and loving, just and kind to the righteous and unrighteous. Hagar and Ishmael had been dealt harshly, sent into the wilderness, destined to die, save for the promise of God that he had given to Abraham in verse 13. And they could perhaps be representative of us all when we were once separated from God as Gentiles in the wilderness, that is, as banished peoples from God, wandering aimlessly in this, in this ultimately hopeless, ultimately empty world. No matter how much we try to hope in this world, no matter how much we try to find meaning in this world, if it's the current zeitgeist of the fashion, I don't need to elaborate it. This world only seems to be getting worse rather than getting better. There was a time where Christians believed that the world was getting better, and nations were embracing Christ, and this heaven would come on earth. But today, it's the opposite for us. We, we look at this world, and we just think, God, we need you to step in. And yet, in our most desolate times, when we are most hopeless, and we feel unjustly treated, when we feel unloved, and we feel reduced to nothing, God reaches out to us. Hagar was suicidal. Hopeless, ready to accept her fate. Yet God spoke to her in verse 17 and not only saved them, but gave them a hope, a name. What was there before but could not be recognized, now God reveals to her. He opens her eyes and she sees the water that would give them life, that would sustain them. In other words, despite the harsh treatment that they had had, God had not only averted their fate from death to life, He gives them an aim, a hope. Now there's a tendency in all of us to be quite tribal, to make it us versus them, but not so as one who is in the family of God. If this is how God loves those who do not know Him, who perhaps are not chosen by Him, for those even who reject Him, and this extends, if this is how much God loves, even those who we would regard as wicked, how much also should we aspire to be the same? To be tribal, to make it us versus them, to, to, to hate those who are not like us. That is not how God acts, and that is not how we should act. Secondly, we see that salvation again comes only through God's intervention, only through his irresistible grace. Hagar and Ishmael were saved, not by anyone or anything, but our good God. And yet, and yet Ishmael was blessed, but he wasn't chosen. His descendants would not know God and would share in the same figurative fate, facing certain death in the wilderness of the world. 
Yet God had promised that the seed would come and destroy the sin that engulfs the world. And again, in Genesis in chapter verse 12, it says, Through Isaac shall your seed be named. So it's interesting. Isaac himself is in the seed, but through Isaac, the seed that will, the, or the person that will overcome sin would come. And the Israelites, they grew and they prospered, and there was countless of opportunities for this to happen, but all of them fell. All of them fell short. They themselves were chucked into the wilderness, exiled, banished from God's kingdom for a time. And years later, if you turn with me to John chapter 4, years later, from Abraham's time would come a man called Jesus. And he approaches a Samaritan woman who, who again, is not a member of God's chosen family. She was a sinner, an outcast, and she was all alone again in the desert heat. She did not know who God was and was waiting for him to intervene, for the Savior to come to the world to pave the way back to God. Just as God opened Hagar's eyes to the well of water that gave her life, so Jesus opens this Samaritan woman's eyes to living water. Jesus says to her, whoever drinks of water from the well will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And again, he says in verse 23 in chapter 4, But the hour is coming, and it's now here, when true worshippers worship God the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. There is a way now, there is a way to come back into the family of God. So the woman says, I know that when the Messiah is coming, he will tell us about all these things. And Jesus responds by saying, I, am, I who speak to you am he. He proclaims himself the Savior to bring us back into the family of God. So Christ came and he showed us the way to heaven through his sacrifice for our sins on the cross, that those who believe in him would have eternal life, never to thirst again. Like that well of water in the desert, so too is Jesus the water, the living water to our lives. So, what is the way from brokenness to blessedness? It is through Jesus. And what is our role then in, in enabling someone to come to God? Do we persuade them with clever rhetoric? Do we argue with them all day long? Do we beat them over the head with the Bible? The answer is to show them God's promises, to show how God is faithful, and how ultimately God is revealed it in Jesus Christ. So we come to the end of today's passage. And the conclusion is this. Choose life, choose God, choose Christ. Life without God is ultimately like wandering in the desert without an aim and without an inheritance, just like Hagar and Ishmael. But life with God is joy and feasting, life and promise, for God is faithful to us all. He is faithful to us all through Christ, and He is faithful to the broken and the blessed. Amen.